You're going to be so glad you tuned in for this. This is kind of a new friend, Steve Cuss. Hey, Steve. Hey, John. Uh, and he's written a fabulous book called Managing Leadership Anxiety. Nancy's favorite book. My wife just <laughs> likes it way better than any book I have ever written and any book that she has ever written. And uh, it's fabulous on anxiety. It's fabulous on leadership. We were, we're in Oklahoma right now. Right. Meeting yeah. with some other really, really good friends, having a fabulous discussion, and it consummated in the idea <laughs> that we ought to actually just videotape some of these thoughts. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. We've been walking together in this Lenten season through this book by Dallas Willard, Renovation of the Heart. We're looking right now at the mind, mm. and uh, that's where anxiety dwells. So I want to read a quote from Dallas, and then you had some fabulous thoughts about when we try to take over God's role in our minds. Right. So... Here's what Dallas writes. A lot of what we've been talking about here is the vision for a redeemed mind. And Dallas talks about the need for a vision, but then also for intention. And he says, the intention to be formed is to have the great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, a constant presence in our mind, crowding out every false idea or destructive image, all misinformation about God, and every crooked inference or belief. That's the tension, to have the great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ a constant presence in our mind. Thus, it is the intention to use divinely powerful weapons for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Mm. That's what Paul writes. But of course, part of our problems in our mind is that just like back in the garden, we want to take God's place. Yeah. So Steve, I'd love for you to share with folks some of those thoughts. Yeah, and also let's just note how underlined that book is. You've, you've been in that book a lot. <laughs> I've been in that book yeah. a lot, yeah. yeah. But not as much yeah. as Nancy is under like oh, your right. book, huh, <laughs> Nancy? So funny, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so obviously one of my fields is what's known as chronic anxiety. Mm. And, it, and we do just have to start by saying it's a particular kind of anxiety. It's not like grief or trauma. Mm. And it's not like anxiety that requires psychiatric medicine, which I believe is a gift from God. Yeah. Um, chronic anxiety is built on false belief. That's why I get so fascinated with it. Ah. So it's built on the idea that I think I need something that I don't really need. Wow. Uh, like the need to impress somebody, the need to always get it right. Um, gosh, I don't know, like the need to control a situation. Like some people, they'll go into a room, uh, a staff meeting, and they'll already have all six scenarios figured out, this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, That's chronic anxiety. It's built on assumptions and needs. And then you know you're filled with chronic anxiety because you're getting bigger or smaller. Someone yeah. like me, I tend to get bigger, so I get a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Our mutual friend Kevin, we learned tonight, yes. gets bigger when he's anxious. He does. He's actually called a silverback. Silverback. We don't need to get into that. We don't need to get into yeah. that right yeah. now. Uh, and then others get smaller. They suddenly f don't feel safe, and so they like retract like a turtle, mm -hmm. and they don't share everything they think. Mm -hmm. They hold their opinion back. Mm -hmm. And then those people get interesting because then they have like their own meeting after the meeting. They're not comfortable saying something in the meeting yeah. and they wait till they're yeah. their own. So bigger and smaller. And so, yeah, there's five core generators of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And this was like a light bulb moment for me when I realized that human beings, we strive for control, uh, perfection, always having the answer, which is one of mine. Mm -hmm. um, if you put me in a staff meeting and uh, even at the table tonight before we film this, somebody asks someone else a question, I'm managing my compulsion to answer. Oh gosh. Even though no one asked me. <laughs> so having the answer, being there for others, that's one of mine too. Um, anytime somebody somewhere is in need, I must be there. And I think it's about being others focused, but it's really about the need to be needed. So it's kind of sneaky. Oh my goodness, yeah, chronic anxiety, it shows up. M most of us don't know we're anxious until we're really anxious. Say that one more time. Yeah, most of us don't know we're anxious until we're like really, really anxious. So it's usually the people around us that can help us 
know that we're filled with chronic anxiety. So maybe people who are watching us right now could just pause for a moment and check in. Mm -hmm. Am I actually anxious right now? They could, yeah. And you can feel it in your body. Mm -hmm. And they could also, if they're brave, ask somebody who loves them. <laughs> um, how do you know I'm anxious when I don't know I'm anxious? Yeah. And, uh, and they'll tell you. Yeah. So control perfection, always having the answer, always being there for people and then approval. That's one of mine as well. I want people to like me. If you want to see me anxious, just say that you're disappointed in me and you can see this thing. Yeah. So it occurred to me when I was doing this study, okay, if, if chronic anxiety is built on false belief and the gospel is built on the truth and Jesus says truth sets you free and to jump on it, Paul says this weird like convoluted thing that it's for freedom that we've been set free, which sounds like a circular argument, but it really is something. I think it occurred to me as, okay, the control, perfection, these things, these are God's unique attributes. Wow. And anytime a human being is diminishing ourselves or supersizing ourselves, we're not human sized. We're trying to be like God. Uh, and so the idea is that you can notice your chronic anxiety. You can try to figure out which one of these you are hanging on to. And then the goal, and it's a very willed idea, is you're then trying to relax into the grace of God. Oh, you're just trying to. I love that phrase yeah. to relax into the grace of God. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of it. Wow, wow. And uh, did that come about mostly through working with other people, or did it come about through careful examination of your own life? Yeah, that's a fun and loaded question. Uh, my first job out of college was a trauma chaplain, and I just couldn't cope with the grief and the onslaught. And I think I was most surprised at all my reactivity showing up because what happens obviously in grief is is i was trying to shrink it down so i could manage it rather than learn how to enter into someone's pain could you say a word about reactivity that's a word that i keep hearing about a lot i think i have a general sense of it but yeah. what what does that mean to be reactive or reactivity yeah reactivity chronic anxiety it puts you in a false reality you're actually no longer able to see what's really going on so my very first encounter as a chaplain um, I get paged into the intensive care. There's someone's died. There's 12 screaming people. And because of my false belief, I believe I have to have the answer. I don't have the answer. So I get reactive. Mm. So now what I do without realizing it is I take charge. So I actually, I'm not proud of this, John, but I actually called a meeting with these people. I'm like, Hey everybody. I'm right. It's yeah. funny. Uh, but I didn't know what to do. And so then it's, I'm, I'm no longer able to see what the situation calls for. I'm also no longer able to see God. Is chronic anxiety actually fills the space where you're aware of God's presence. Oh, gosh. So yeah. hang on one second. Yeah, yeah. Chronic anxiety fills the space where you would otherwise be aware of God's presence. Yeah, my favorite metaphor is a tapeworm. It's like, it, it, it's not a pleasant metaphor, but it bores a hole and then it feeds off you and grows. Wow. And you wow. can't see God anymore. So, so now I'm in this room and it's all on me. I believe it's on me to figure something out rather than me attending to what God's doing. So the idea of noticing your reactivity and when you're getting bigger or smaller um, is really a powerful tool to yes. engage God. Yes. And uh, now that you know those things, how do you use them to help you make God more present? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the opposite of anxiety in this field is curiosity. Uh, and it's fascinating that Jesus used curiosity more than almost any other tool. Wow. Yeah, like the woman caught in adultery and the angry, violent mob, and he just goes in and asks curious questions, and they all kind of... Kind i got to ask you about that. Why I would think the opposite of anxiety would be peace. Uh, me too. Yeah. Why, would, <laughs> why would it be curiosity? I don't know. That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. And right now we're, we're triggering on one of my false needs, the idea yeah. that I'm sitting here on camera saying, I don't know. Yeah. But I heard that from a system series named Trisha Taylor, and it is true. I love it. It's yes. amazing. Yes. Yeah. So if you can notice when you're anxious and then if you can pause, because anxiety is telling you just try harder. Just So anxiety is a form of legalism. It's just trying to keep you on the treadmill of do more. Oh. And so if you can notice when you're in that cycle, once you figure out where you are, you can start to be aware of yourself. You can notice your triggers and then you can preempt it. Uh, so, so for me, it's a simple prayer. I pray, gosh, John, I mean, I, I better pray it multiple times a day. And it's just Jesus died to free me from blank, whatever blank is. Or Jesus died to free me from having to shoot a video and know the answer, for example, in real time. 
or Jesus died, so I, I don't need to impress that person anymore. And some of that was from Dallas. I remember you and he talking. It might have been you that was telling how he could speak and not be concerned about how he did. Yeah. And I was Freedom all, from outcomes. Yeah. Freedom from outcomes. I remember yeah. hearing that. I was all wrapped up in performance anxiety as a preacher, and I thought, I, I want... I want that like if that's actually possible i want that so that kind of that was part of for me diving into these corn wow yeah. wow yeah this has flown by thank would you yeah. do this again sometime oh this is fun absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah so so today be free those five items again yeah so we... control perfection uh having the answer being there for people and approval those are the big five so let's be free of that let's form the intention to have that great God present in our mind to crowd out all five and be curious. See you next time.